How the humble blouse got women out to work and revolutionized the city's manufacturing industry in the process. These are shop workers wearing blouses in the Liverpool store at Marks and Spencer's Limited. This was in 1909, a few years before the First World War, and all of them are wearing manufactured blouses. And I would imagine it's not just blouses that they manufactured, they also manufactured skirts and jackets and uh, dresses, even underwear, not only for women, but for men as well. This is by Susan Rowland, PhD candidate, University of Brighton in the UK on the conversation. As more people are encouraged to head back to the office, they'll be swapping their homeware for their workwear. One staple of the working wardrobe has particularly interested roots, the humble blouse, gained prominence around the turn of the 20th century thanks to new manufacturing techniques. Worn with a plain skirt, the blouse became a fashion essential in the wardrobes of working and socially active women across the British class spectrum. Clerical workers, suffragettes, and members of the royal family all began to proudly wear them. The blouse and skirt provided a more comfortable way of dressing than the tight bodices and bustle skirts of the late Victorian period at the start of the 20th century, the Edwarian blouse was elaborate and decorative. The blouse of the 1910s was much simpler in style and shape. As my research on blouse manufacturing in the 1910s shows, during this period, the blouse was developed as a factory-produced commodity. Designers created loose-fitting garments sized proportionately as with men's shirts by the collar. Sizes ranged from 13 to 15 inches and included half sizes. Ready-made blouses were created from natural fibers including cotton, linen, silk, or wool, or fiber blends like flannelette. Before this, most women made their own blouses or purchased custom-made ones from a dressmaker, so this period was a turning point. From 1909, the first artificial silk was introduced to the blouse market by textile giant Kurtolz, made from a blend of cotton and wool pulp viscose Artificial silk blouses offered women the glossy luxures, a luster of silk in a practical blouse able to sustain repeated washings. Importantly, a fashion and design history academic Cheryl Buckley explains that by 1910, over half of all single women worked outside the home. A collection of four or five lightweight blouses worn with one plain skirt and sometimes a jacket formed an ideal working wardrobe for busy typists, teachers, and shop workers. Lucrative blouse making, high demand for easy to launder practical blouses from these newly working women offered fresh money making opportunities for a range of wholesale manufacturers. Even traditional hosiery manufacturers recognized the economic value of blouses. For 200 years, Leicester in England's East Midlands was the center of hosiery and knit production. By 1910s, it had well-established networks of production and distribution, which helped its manufacturers embrace the lucrative business of blouse making. Leicester's largest manufacturer, N. Corin & Sons, known for football jerseys, woolen swimsuits, stockings, and vests, was an early adapter of blouse making. By 1912, they employed an extra 350 blouse makers at their St. Margaret's Works site, in addition to 2,500 hosiery workers. As an industry equipped to manufacture knitted goods, it might seem surprising that Coras invested in new factory space and semi-skilled workers devoted to blouse making. But with high demand for ready-made blouses and fast profits to be made, several of Leicester's hosiery factories eagerly began manufacturing blouses. Now, wartime blouses, Blouse making continued sporadically at Coras during the First World War. In October 1914, weekly clothing industrial, industry uh, trade journal, The Drapers, re record reported that Leicester's knit industries were working into the night to keep up with orders from the War Department. All of Coras knitted underwear and accessories were made available for the troops, with the blouse department making khaki shirts for the troops. Some military details crept into the blouse design through shoulder epaulets and patch pockets. The war also affected design through shortages of materials, which ultimately led to simpler and less decorative blouses. Metal was delivered to the war effort 
leaving hooks and eyes in short supply. This resulted in wider use of buttons. In fact, in 1919, the most usual blouse fastening, fastening was a single button, which demonstrates the inventiveness of designers faced with scarcities of materials and labor. Despite shortages of materials, profiteering, and transportation difficulties, wartime conditions enhanced the blouse trade. High levels of employment and industry, industrial production for the war effort led to the increase in disposable income among working class women. These women had money to spend for the first time on new, ready-made fashion, and as the Drapers record reported, this included solid, low-priced blouses. For factories making blouses, this new market was an added bonus. In July 1916, Corps released an update on their wartime activities, which managed to be patriotic while subtly reminding wholesale customers of the fit and finish of their St. Margaret label blouses. It said, although our large blouse department has been working for months at high pressure on army shirts, we can guarantee to our customers the same careful attention and performance, perfection and fit and fin finesse and finish that has always been the distinguishing feature of St. Margaret blouses. As the war drew to a close, the Draper's record claimed that Leicester's export trade was resting with both eyes open while drawing up plans to remind the world of its prominence in manufacturing. Going forward, the Leicester trade was said to be the optimistic, optimistic because the government heavy wartime demands had enabled factories to install the latest equipment while overcoming frustrating technical difficulties. Unfortunately, Corey's foray into ready-made blouse fashion was ultimately unsustainable. When fashions changed in the 1920s in favor of dropped waist, tubular shift dresses, demand for ready-made blouses tumbled, leading Cora to concentrate once again solely on knitted underwear and sportswear. This is on The Conversation by Suzanne Rowland, Creative Commons. Please leave your comments. Thank you. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.